Linux OTC. Welcome to episode 31. I'm Bill. I'm Majid. And I'm Leo. Majid is good at uh, being awake even though he doesn't want to be. <laughs> you you can't funny. not be in his line of work. Yeah, yeah gotta, I suppose so. Gotta, yeah, no, right just, uh, no, just been a lot of traveling this week. I uh, went down to the Royal College uh, for the annual college tutor meeting, which was which was fine. Um, learned stuff. I do get the feeling that for a lot of the people that turn up, it is just so that they can then get uh, bladdered at the gala dinner in the evening. <laughs> uh, which, as a man who doesn't drink, kind of does make me feel a bit like, you know, I, I, do, I do kind of stick out a little bit, I suppose. The food was good, actually. The food was good. Um, there was a reason, reasonable number of quite a lot of people who came, actually. It was... Um, so I, I had the... I, so I live about, what, 120 miles, 130 miles from central London so I always have this kind of thing in the back of my mind should I drive because I could probably get there in about an hour and a half or something like that and every time I have driven it's just been a complete and a disaster uh, you know because the traffic in London is terrible remember mm. London is not a planned city it's an organic city that's been around for the best part of 2000 years and so you know the the roads are tiny and you know you can only get single lane things in half the time and anyway so then i decided i'll take the train which was a good which was a good decision um i was hope planning on staying with a friend of mine but unfortunately um night before he they had a death in their family and so i had to um and he was like oh i'm not sure um what's happening i said look dude hosting me is the least of your concerns you know sort things out you know with your family it'd been a it was a child as well um nine-year-old kid poor guy um anyway so um i find myself at like three o'clock in the morning trying to book a hotel um and obviously if you're doing it that last minute in central london you know it's going to be expensive which it was. Um, and so, yeah, you know, just been kind of, uh, there seems to be a lot of traveling in my family at the minute because, so I was in London. My son went to Egypt yesterday with his friends. Uh, lads uh, trip to the pyramids and all that sort of thing. He's been wow, sending me, cool. he's been sending me pictures and it's 45 degree. Oh, hold on. It's 110 degrees. Ooh, wait, know. does he do that thing where he takes a picture of the pyramid and then turns around and takes another picture and it's of KFC? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think it'd be far off. Actually, he's probably not clever enough to have thought of that one. Actually, I've, I've seen. I've seen a couple of those pictures where, where like, if you get the right angle, you can get this strip of you know mo modernity, and then you can also see the 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 pyramids over here. Yeah, yeah. And then my daughter is going on a school trip. Uh, beginning of next week to Turkey. They're going wow. to Istanbul and check out all the historical sites and stuff in Istanbul. So it's a, uh, um, yeah, it seems to seems to be uh, traveling, you know, the traveling shakes at the minute. Um, uh, one thing, you Europeans it, 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 and your travel. Yeah, I mean, it had been a while since I'd been on a train. But I had th I had heard that things like Wi-Fi and all this kind of stuff had improved. No, they haven't improved. And I had all these plans for while I sat on the train. I'd, you know, why go through this document and fill out this presentation. You know, maybe even catch a movie. No, nah, I couldn't do anything. It was just the whether it was the temperamental Wi-Fi in the in the train or whether it was you know, when I said, oh, forget it, I'm just going to hotspot it from my phone, but phone signal is rubbish because it's, you know, the countryside. You know, I mean, it's not It's not like it's, it was the middle of nowhere. I mean, you know, I was going on a pretty uh, well-developed route, but, and then at the end, I, I, after about, after a while, I thought, you know what, just forget this. Forget this, put everything away, 
uh, let me just listen to heavy metal. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's always the, that's always the right choice. Yeah, and so uh, uh, I ended up uh, uh, doing that. Um, the other thing that, that was slightly annoying was that um, I mentioned, I think, on Minkcast, I'd bought a uh, OnePlus pad, you know, their Android tablet. I think I said, I think they're getting the new ones coming out, so they're getting rid of old stock. So I got it with the keyboard and the pen and all this kind of stuff. And I'd used it the last time I went to a conference um, last month. And I found it useful because it was it was easy to kind of take photos of presentations and then kind of. Oh, you were the guy in the concert holding the the pad up and yeah, blocking I, everybody behind Z, behind you. Yeah, you. that's me. That's me. Ah, that's me. man. Yeah. yeah, but then it becomes really easy then to kind of extract the text and then you know annotate and all this kind of stuff. You know, it really makes my um, uh, it really ups my uh, superchargers, my notes game. Um, unfortunately, that. pen decide to stop working um, android stuff man android well, stuff well well and it 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 won't charge the thing is, is it, it won't charge and anyway, i contacted one plus and one plus were like well why don't you factory reset the one the pad and whatever i said no no there's nothing wrong with the device the device is working fine it's nothing wrong with the bluetooth because i can still connect other bluetooth things to it it's this thing doesn't charge i'm sure it's just dead You know what I mean? And there's no other way of charging it. There's no like USB thing or anything like that. It's that magnetic sticker on the top and, you know, it does the induction charging. Um, and so the guy kind of goes, oh, okay, well, um, so if you send it in for a repair, we'll replace it for you. I went, okay, because we don't, we didn't, we, we don't normally repair these things. We just replace them. Okay, fine. But it'll be $30 both ways. No, no, I mean, it's, it, it didn't, he said, he didn't say anything about charges. Oh wait, that's But, right. You're you're in Europe. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But then when I actually went onto the website to try and do it, there's no section for returning that. You know what it says? Choose your device, right? And it's like it's not in the list. So I was I was basically having like a a, a chat conversation with the uh, customer service guy, and I said to him, um, it, you know, there's, there's no option for that. And he goes, Yeah, you'll have to send everything back. Excuse oh, me. Oh, what? Excuse me, what? Yeah, if you send everything back, then we'll send you back the the tablet with the pencil, but now one that's working. Went, but so I've, what? I've got two. I bought these things separately. Yeah, and anyway, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm I'm not happy about that. So I'm gonna have another. But, but then, it's you know, been 30 days. Just take it back to the place, right? Just take it back to the place that you bought it, or did you buy it online? But online from oh. OnePlus. Okay, well then just issue a return thing on just the pin because it was a separate purchase, right? Yeah, I know. I, I go on there. It just it won't let me do it. You can't return the thing. Not 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 get service on it. Not get warranty service. Like return it. Give me my money back. Because it's been just over thirty days. Oh, got him. Okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. By by two days. By two days. Mm. It was the okay, 11th, apparently. Here's what you do. You buy another pin, and then you put the, the the broken pin in the box of the new pin, and then you send the new pin back, and you get your money back, right? I mean, do they check the serial numbers on that thing? I don't know. You could take <laughs> a chance. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. The, uh, There's a OnePlus guy uh, listening to the podcast. Sorry. Yeah, going. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yep. And this guy's yeah. name is Majid. Okay. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, so yeah, that's stupid. That, that's terrible. Yeah, that, yeah that's it. That is, and I did have my laptop with me, but I didn't have because I I know I th did somebody actually I think messaged in as well saying what apps are good for stylus and Linux. Is it X Journal and a couple of external, others? External, Journal, external, something plus, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, but I hadn't installed any of them or anything like that, and I didn't have a stylus with me anyway uh, for that uh, machine. Doesn't the Android keyboard have like a like a stylus input? So I mean, it doesn't really matter what app you're you're doing in. Or are you talking about like it retains the the handwriting? I guess. Yeah, it retains the handwriting. You know, to use uh, okay, it for handwriting yeah. notes, that kind of thing. Right. That kind okay. Of thing. So um, uh, yeah. So 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 that's uh, so that's uh, that really. Um, man, man, that's terrible. Uh, it's just, it's just annoying. And the thing is, who's got time right. to deal with this stuff? That's the thing. 
it's well, less exactly. the it's less the thing. It's not as you said. If it was a case of having bought it in a brick and mortar shop, you just kind of go in and go, not working, sort it out, mate. But yeah. th- this is the issue you have when you buy stuff online, and this is why, how much I t- I'm complaining about Amazon. Uh, right, Amazon at least are brilliant when it comes to returns. Oh yeah, you well, know. I mean they they make they make so much money. You know, even a million dollars in returns is, isn't gonna whatever that's just like is it broken i don't know don't even test it put it actually put it back in the refurbished pile and set it back out <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's how that goes half the time they'll send me the replacement before they even re- receive the thing back i've had them right do that right before. yeah give you a whole month to send it back man yeah. you're not in any rush and in, uh, around black friday at least in the uk they were giving you four months as Whoa. the return period yeah so i remember Ow. once buying a smartwatch but having it wearing it for a couple of months and then thinking Mm, it's all right. Wait a minute. I want to know when the return window is. Oh, I've got another two days left. Let's return it. So I had four yeah. months of use of it out of it. Wow. Hey, but yeah. I mean, seriously, then when you put in, there's nothing wrong with it. They really just put it in the refurbished pile. Don't even yeah. check it. And then send it right back out with your skin on it still. Yeah, it's fine. If anybody, yeah. you know, I'm not trying to have my skin. <laughs> I'm giving yeah. it away for free, man. That's right. That's right. You're just going to be yeah. a little Majid clone somewhere over there. It'll be yeah. Fun. Yeah, and then the the other thing that's been slightly annoying me is this whole. So I'm running Ubuntu Unity, and I don't know why I keep getting oh, random. Yeah. Uh, well, you've already random said random network, it. Ne- random network things going. Because it's only on the a... Unity spin, you know. If exactly. I've used, you've already answered but, your question. Yeah, but then okay, so I've been on the Unity Discords and stuff like that, and people are like, "Nah, never happens. Never seen it before ever." Okay, all right. And that was it. It wasn't even a kind of, why don't you at least check this or why don't you at least check that or whatever. So, yeah, well, I just, mean, why don't you check the logs? Did you, I mean, and not in a, that's the least asshole ish way I could possibly say that. But why don't you check? Have you checked the logs? No. Yeah. So that, I mean, that would be my first step is let's see what the logs say about this. What does, uh, you know, the journal for system, uh, not, not system, what does the network manager say uh, when it disconnects? Is it hardware related? What does D message say? Mm-hmm. Um, when you, when, when that happens, I mean, you just, after it happens, run D message, it'll be in the last, you know, 20 or 30 things in the log. If something catastrophic happened and uh, maybe how just accessing just... logs would be an interesting topic for, yeah, I was gonna say, I'm, no, I've I, already I, told you how to do a D message. Well, done. because it's not, <laughs> it's not immediately obvious to a lot of people how to access. Oh no, of course not. It's like, for... it's like getting to the event viewer in, in windows. Right. I mean, right. even, even when you do get in there, what does any of that mean? So uh, I'm not offering this. Let me read your logs for you service to everybody that's listening. But I'm not not offering it. I mean, I'll I'll I'm not a doctor, but I'll take a look. Majid is a doctor. He'll also take a look, but he'll know less, which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how, how do I do that then? So did you say you said you already said some stuff? Well, you're on the network right now, so I'm gonna yeah. guess that D message isn't gonna have anything for you. But if you drop off this call, then run D message immediately. D M E S G. And that will give you all the hardware logs. So this is, DMessage holds information specifically about the hardware itself. So Read you know, kernel buffer failed. Operation not permitted. Pseudo. Well, pseudo. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And pipe uh, it through less, and then it'll, it'll give you... Uh, see, you're already... That's too complicated. Am I that's going too, too complicated. Far? He's running it in a GUI. He can scroll with the mouse. It's fine. Uh, you're it's you're going... You, inter- you hit intermediate. amount of data. Yeah, you you've hit intermediate difficulty already with this pipe it to whatever. That's too much. Yeah, oh, there's loads of stuff here. Right, and and it usually puts you down at the bottom, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So you're seeing the most current stuff at the very bottom, um, mm-hmm. and most of the time it takes time to really understand what that stuff is is saying. But some of it's pretty readable because mm-hmm. um, it's pretty straightforward what it says. And uh, if I'm not mistaken d message will only show the current boots buffer maybe not i don't remember actually um so it, uh, it, you might not be able to go all the way back and see the last time that it did it but um okay. if you but, find but, but then but, but when the next time it does it i can do this and it would at least give me a some details yeah, some, something to copy paste to us so yeah. that we can maybe figure out uh what's ha- if, if it's hardware level and if it's not then that means it's software level and we can use uh, journal control, which is the, the logger thing for the uh-huh. system to dig down and try and figure out what it is. So we're mostly just isolating the problem. But 
that's that's troubleshooting in a nutshell is work big start from real obvious stuff and then yeah. work your way down because i'm thinking right like if it's only on linux or if it's only on a uh, uh, unity then it's probably not a hardware problem like like as in you know it's not plugged in or yeah, your yeah, wi-fi yeah. access point died right like so i'm, I'm not thinking that far mm -hmm. uh, but i am thinking maybe for some reason maybe a specific kernel version that it's running. I don't know why it would be running on a different kernel version, but maybe it's disconnecting the, the card for a little mm. while for some reason. Is there, but, a, yeah. uh, is there an interface level problem that maybe they're using some other version of Network Manager or something like that? But that, it's in Ubuntu, so it would be using the yeah, same thing. Yeah, but it's in Ubuntu, the, yes. So you would yeah. explain it the same on, the, on all the others. And that was the thing that got me, because it was like all the other Ubuntu's work. It, in fact, hey, that, Endeavor, uh, that Endeavor OS experiment never had this issue with that. Yeah, you know, so it, but it must maybe, be something in Unity code somewhere. Well, but to what. Bill's point, maybe they're not using Network Manager for some crazy reason. I I don't know what they're running. I assume it is Network Manager, but well, see, and, that's it because regular Ubuntu uses NetPlan on the back end. Yeah, but it's still mm. Network Manager. Net NetPlan will overwrite Network Manager settings, but when you're running the desktop, it's still Network Manager handling it on the user side. That's what you're interacting with. It's just NetPlan underneath to to do this declarative set this IP address yeah. or, you know, bond these network interfaces or whatever. I just I mean, want to, if there, if there is, if they are using another version of Network Manager to match up with Unity, and presumably it would be based on some old code from, you know, the Unity days. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it's not working too well with NetPlan mm -hmm. or something like that. I don't know. Or Yeah. Is, is Ubuntu still using... WPA supplicant, or are they have they moved to IWD, the new thing? You got me. I'm surely it's whatever is new. Um, what I mean, you're on twenty four oh four, right? Uh, Unity. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. I, I don't imagine they're using anything crafty. Surely yeah, it's whatever is the new one. Yeah, it's an LTS at the end of the day as well. So yeah. You're, uh, but um, the last time I, I touched that was on Gen two, and I don't even remember what it was. So. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing, I, my next idea for a project is one that I've been kind of mulling over in my head for a long time, but I've never got round to doing, um, is I think I'm finally going to get a NAS. All um, right. Um, first, I thought I'd, uh, first I thought I'd use the Raspberry Pi that I've got as a NAS. You could. Which I could. Um, having seen how well me, me trying to turn that into my own next cloud instance went. And I think we even did a couple of shows on this as well, didn't we, Bill? Um, yeah. And yeah, how um, how much of an immense success that was. <laughs> Sar sarcasm fully intended. Look, look, um, you know the I, answer I, I, to I, this. I think I might as well just pay the money and actually just get a proper NAS. I mean, yes, but also the answer to that was that you didn't use Ubuntu and use the Snap because you have an aversion. But that's the answer. If you want it simple, low down, you don't do much, that's the answer to it all. I mean, no, I did use Snap. I think I did use the Snap of Next, next when I was for, Really? Yeah. And what uh, it was just my own it, it, it was just my own ineptness and um I mean, it's uh, still ignorance, right ignorance of how networking works is what stymied that. Yeah, I mean, really it's still it's else. still running, you know, services that you have to admin. So, I mean, it's not like it's, uh, oh, yeah, just plug it in and it works and everything. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, so do you, like, now I'm curious because I, I guess I missed those episodes. What what uh, what happened with it? So, setting up, you know, d d downloading Ubuntu server, you know, fl um, flashing on the card, putting it in. It's a Pi 400 is what I've got. Okay. So, got built a uh, keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then one of the first things I realized was that, you know, you have to use, if you want to use it as an, well, if you want to use it, say, as an, as an xCloud instance, then the, the Pi has to be able to see all the software, sorry, all the, um, all the storage that you can. Um, and so um, I had to format the, the micro SD card in a particular way. Um, uh, the way around to doing that was just to get a USB drive and then connect that up and have that as the cloud. Yeah, well, that's thing. that's what you're going to be doing with an NAS anyway, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I um, 
as I said, this is this is when I was making the next cloud instance. I mean, I, but I was, as I'm saying, because of the way that this went, I'm, I did think about Raspberry Pi NAS, but I'm not gonna. I don't. I don't think. Yeah. And um, then what happened? Then, then what happened was I couldn't get port forwarding to work properly. And part of the thing, well, tail so, scale is the answer to that. Don't port forward. That's, that's yeah. Dangerous. So, so that's so. Then that was step number three, which was tail scale, right? Um. There, but then there was then I was having issues with other devices syncing to it when not on my home network, and then at that point, I my my, my brain kind of just burnt a bit, and I was just kind so, of like. Uh, this is getting, I, I'm not getting this, I'm, let's just stop. So but I just stopped I, at that point. Let me be clear on this though, that like you're, you have traversed multiple IT disciplines by doing all of this, right? I mean, you've got the hardware stuff that you're dealing with. You've got network stuff in the form of port forwarding and tail scale. You've got, you know, old man sysop or system administrative stuff dealing with Nextcloud and databases and all of that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you're, don't feel bad because mm -hmm. These are quite literally three separate titles that you would that you would have to ask normal people, normal IT folks to help you do. Um, surely, someone could do it all, but I mean, it, it's a it's a lot of information to be able to fully understand what you're doing with all these commands and all this stuff and all these ideas. With you know, because with Tailscale, right, you've got to set up the DNS stuff, and <laughs> you know that that's its own that's its own bear. Yeah, I mean, it. yeah, I mean, I, I, st I mean, tail scale is wonderful, but I still don't exactly figure it out how it works. Yeah, I, 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 I conceptually in my head, I'm, I still don't get how. Well, most it works. people don't. That's the thing about tail scale is that most people don't even know what they're doing. They just know that once they get it to a point where this thing can see this thing, they've, they've, you know, it works. Cool, I'm good. I'll, I'll never touch it again. Um, and then it's, a, it's, uh, I would imagine it's a very few amount of people that actually go in and, um, and, and start tinkering with the magic DNS stuff and, you know, exposing out uh, these these services to, to the actual wider internet and all of that kind of thing. And, Understanding and, networking as a whole is like wrapping your head around a whole new universe. Oh, yeah, man. I've built um, an entire career around it. And, yeah. and it takes years. <laughs> it takes years to, to get to the point where you really understand what's what's actually going on. Uh, not that I do. I mean, there are still things in networking that I don't get because it's slower, but things things come in. Tail scale is one of those things. And it's just taking old ideas, wrapping them in a new wrapper because um, I've, I've still, I refuse to use it. I still have not used it. Um, so I'm, I'm only getting information from their website or from other people that use tail scale. Uh, someone told me about the magic DNS thing, which allows you to expose out a server. Um, to the wider internet, which already gives me the heebie-jeebies, because that's what's the difference between that and you know port forwarding, right? You're you're exposing stuff out, um, but it's just it's just interesting. Um, the whole entire thing is interesting. I love the way that everything connects. I love the way the internet works. Uh, so yeah, I, I just keep falling yeah. into that rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, I had to do a little bit of a presentation on that actually. What I mean by that is, I I, I can't remember if it was on Mintcast or OTC, uh, but I mentioned that. I was actually getting people contacting me after the whole um, <clears throat> announcement uh, of the new surfaces and Copilot plus PCs and recall and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one guy actually said, you know what, you, you, uh, you, you keep telling me about the fact that you've been learning Linux for how many years and this, that and the other. Um, you know, what, can I come around and actually have a look at your systems? I went, <laughs> yeah, man, cool. Come around. So, Sucker. so I was, uh, anyway, so he came round and I had, and I've got this box, which is running Ubuntu Unity. And then I've got, you know, I had, uh, I've got my Lenovo, which was running Ubuntu, well, it had been Ubuntu Cinnamon, but I've bastardized it and Frankensteined it to being back into being normal Ubuntu. And the other one was just running Ubuntu 2404 LTS. And um, I had my Ventoy stick, which had a whole bunch of different distros on there. So I could kind of show to him. So, you know, these are how all the different distros work. And, you know, yes, this is what I've got on. But this is how this and this is how dual booting and this, that and the other. And it was it was an interesting experience. 
Uh, Did that scare him away? Because I, I feel like that's what scares a lot of people away from Linux. Because you, the very first thing you present them to, and this is not your fault. This is just a. This is how Linux is. Um, is a a question of choice of like nine choices, and then you know people are like, right. yeah, uh, it's, what, it, 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 it's what I call it's what I call the car park problem. You know, yeah. if you get, if you will go into a car park and you see a space, you go and park your car there. If you go into a car park and there's like. 10, 15 different spaces. And you're like, shit, which one do I go into? Do I go into this one? Okay, this one looks all right. Oh no, this one's quite close to this one. Or right, let me reverse out. And then you get confused and then you're not looking what you're doing and then you end up hitting someone. And then See? you're kind of, and it's like, it's like the, it's like the brain can, can't deal with too much choice sometimes. I think this is okay. The, your analogy makes a whole lot of sense in my life because it, when I go to a car park like that and I see, you know, I could get a good space or, you know, get a mediocre space. My first thought is, you know what? I'm parking at the very back. Number one, no one's gonna hit my car and number two i get a walk-in so hey all right so my my first inclination is to do it the hard way and then here i have gen 2 sitting right here works quite well <laughs> and I've, I've got some use flags that i need to fix up or whatever but i just have an inclination to do it the hard way i guess so yeah. that that explains a lot about me okay yeah oh, you're helping me figure myself out majid i appreciate yeah. that well I, I am a doctor at the end ah, of the day. See? Yeah. um and the, anyway so of course, this is the time when the Ventoy stick dies. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I then had to kind of break things down into, spe into specifics because it's like, okay, so Linux Mint is Linux and Ubuntu. So what's Ubuntu then? And it's like, so, and then, and this guy's reasonably technical. He's a doctor as well. He's been a big fan of Android and, you know, uh, different um, distro distributions, you know, One UI or launchers and all that sort of stuff. So it's not like I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about this. Anyway, as, Ke uh, as kept on discussing this, that, he then kind of said, can't I do a lot of this stuff on Windows already? Right. You know, and I was like going the customization, the workflow, the this and that and the other. And then we got to the nub of what was his reasoning, why he was coming. You know, what had mm. two things, actually. Number one, he had now, I think his patience with big tech had run out. You know, he'd been using Microsoft devices. Um, he's got a couple of iPads and things as well, but they're mainly for the kids, you know. Um, he's been, you know, a a subscriber on you know uh 265 um and all the other th and all that sort of stuff and he was kind of like okay you know what i think I, I, them taking screenshots of my screen every two seconds i'm sorry but that's a bit too much you know that I'm, I'm trying drawing my line in the sand right and secondly was a political one in that he was saying that look because he you know he's part of this whole um you know, this BDS movement, you know, uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions, uh, you know, in regards to Israel. And he's like, OK, I want to move away from any companies on either side of the conflict, but I want to get away from any companies who have any skin in that game at all. And so I said, well, so what you're actually basically telling me is that you want to go open source, not that you want to go Linux, you want to go open source. And he was like, yeah, it's actually not a bad idea, but are there open source equivalents for the things that I'm using? Okay, mate. Presentation yeah. number two comes out, right? <laughs> and the I t and this one. So the first bit, he wasn't convinced. The second bit, he was. Mm. And so since uh, so since then, for example, he's got rid of Chrome. Oh, uh, that was that needed yeah, to happen anyway. Uh, he's he's moved on to Firefox. Ooh, um, good choice. Use, yeah, he will use Brave, um, and uh, although now he's deciding to have a look into Vivaldi, he's okay. uh, get, getting um, he's gone. So for he's a Proton. plasma guy. He wants the kitchen sink. Yeah. Well, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, he is um, moving over his cloud storage from Microsoft and Google to Proton. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, He's moving over his email services to Proton. Yeah, Very he's nice. getting a he's getting a uh, a, a open source uh, password manager, Bitwarden. Good. You know, and so you know he's you know, and and I think that 
is what's really kind of driven it. And it reminded me a little bit of the... Remember the whole Munich debacle about 10 years ago when... Um, oh, they're trying German, it again. Yeah, and it's different. It's not Munich, though. It's it an, again. Yeah. It's, an, it's another German state. But yeah, you're right. It, it was, it, it's Germany. Um, and the issue that a lot of people, the positives, negatives, lots have been talked about it. I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole thing in, again and again, but one of the ways that they helped or prepared prepared people for that big change was just to change the apps and programs that they were using from the proprietary whatevers, the Microsoft Word, Chrome, whatever, to open source alternatives, you know, LibreOffice and... Um, things like that and that's how if there was any success of that whole uh thing um that that was it because i think even when they did abandon linux and we'll go back to microsoft interestingly microsoft when we having just made it open up a factory or something in the city completely by coincidence obviously mm -hmm. um um as far as i understand they're still using a lot of the open source software that they were that they'd moved their people to, like Thunderbird and stuff. Um, so anyway, um, I took that as a, I thought I, I took that as an afternoon well spent, actually. Well, I think so, because that, that I think is how I ended up in Linux too, um, which is, you know, starting with some of the software that's freely available, and then you start falling into this rabbit hole of, oh, well, wait, you mean the operating system can be free too? And so it wasn't like an entire feature set or it was better than Windows. It was just an alternative to, and I wouldn't have really been exposed to the entire ethos and idea of all of that if I hadn't had started with, uh, well, it may have been GIMP. I don't remember why. Um, but, right, and then, I mean, I also had a had a guy whispering in my ear, you Slackware, here, <laughs> you know, and, and kind of making sure I didn't blow it up on the way in. But I think, you know, you're you're that guy to, to your friend, and... You know, maybe, maybe you just, it's not going to affect that 4% number that we're dealing with over here. But, you know, any positive it, change is good change, right? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and money isn't an issue for him. I mean, in the sense that, you know. So you can buy a framework is what you're saying. Yeah, beautiful, if you want to. He can beautiful. contribute to all these projects is what you're saying. <laughs> we need that. That's, That's what, what we need. need right there. Yeah. No, no. My point being that it's not just like, because, um. Some people come because, oh, it's free and I don't, don't have to pay, you know. But actually, he he kind of likes the free, as in freedom part of it. Yeah. And, you know, it, it and, and it helps with his own personal politics as well. Yeah. You know, because, you know, because he's a guy who well, until has... Well, he, until he gets on the Mastodon and realizes who falls where. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you have people on both ends on a single open source project and you're like, what do I do? Yeah, no, because, I mean, he's he's one of the he's one of these guys who's like literally been out there and as a doctor, you know, worked in some of the hospitals yeah. and oh, things yeah. like that. And he's just like, you know, this stuff is this stuff is nuts. Actually, I met a guy yesterday as well um, when I was in London, old friend of mine, we'd passed our exams together. Um, he's Lebanese and he decided that he'd go and volunteer in. Uh, one of the hospitals uh, in the Gaza Strip, and he was just saying, I have never met more... If angels really exist, yeah, they they live there, because he said the amount of fortitude and resilience and the way that people working under pressure, the doctors managing with the minimum things that they had, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, you'd think you'd go there and be overwhelmed by death and destruction, and he actually found it somehow incredibly inspiring yeah because he's like wow you know how human beings can get through appalling circumstances uh made me think whether maybe i should be doing something to try and contribute as well i mean i have a skill set i have a skill set which is relatively useful to mankind i'm talking about my medicine bit not my networking obviously. yeah i was i was gonna say but also <laughs> take linux right as well and you know <laughs> yeah but yeah I, i'm conscious i've just, I, I've just been me talking how are you guys doing well i'm on arch oh and, god and, are we gonna have to go through this again with oh, all oh, the oh, problems that i'm not here. having any problems at the moment 
Yeah. Uh-huh. This is only was that until... a lie? But was that a what lie, William? He's been he's been on Arch for like twenty eight minutes. How many problems can you possibly have in that? Twenty seven. Well, I mean, <laughs> I got WebRTC working. I got Discord up. I've got OBS Studio recording us. Yeah. Next Cloud. I've got that open to get that ready. For okay, the... that's in a browser. Uh, yeah. Well. Still. Okay, a browser and two Electron apps work. I don't think that's really much of a testament <laughs> to the resilience of your operating system, I, sir. Yeah, and you're not, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not lying. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that is what it is. But we'll see how that goes. But I'm trying to get you convinced to run one of these Atomics and see how you fare, but you haven't, you haven't done it yet. Oh, you know what? That's exactly what I was, I was telling Bill, actually, the other day. I was telling him, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should try one of these atomics, you know, see what will happen. I mean, what's the worst that could possibly go wrong? Yeah, actually, I'll tell you what the worst that could possibly go wrong is. <laughs> not that it, not that it'll break, because it's actually extremely, extremely resistant to breaking. Um, because even when you break it, all you got to do is reboot, press down once, and hit enter, and you're fixed. That's it. But the thing that's going to get you in trouble, though, is that expo- it exposes a lot of these. If you go with, like, the Aurora or the Bluefin the uh, the Ubuntuized ones, um, what's going to end up happening is it's a gateway drug into dealing with DistroBox, which people have trouble installing, so they never even get to the point where they can play with it, but it's already installed. Um, a gateway drug into Homebrew, which, again, a lot of people have trouble installing on Linux. Um, and these are these are like, you know, a cent- DistroBox is an operating system package manager, and Homebrew is like a local package manager to get software that you can't normally get anywhere else. And then there's uh, Flatpak is built in, and then updating. You know how you update on one of those uh, one of those Ubuntu Eyes Atomics? Just update. I'm not telling you to. That's how you do it. The command is just update. And then it Whoa. goes through your entire list of distro boxes and homebrews and flat packs and operating systems and everything else. And it up it goes through everything. And so, I was, everything. so I was looking for uh aurora and i couldn't seem to find it i'm i it's not like spelt in a weird way or something no. or... it's absolutely uh, aurora, spelled in a re- weird way do aurora kde and it's get aurora.dev that's it get aurora.dev go get aurora Dot yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got you. Get a roll. I was doing it. I was doing it like a radio. Dev. Your next gen Linux desktop is here. That's yeah, that's pa- right. Listen, it, powered it, it, by KDE Universal Blue, and you, and made for you. Oh, that reads Aurora is the and ultimate you, OS for, for every you. type of user, from normal yeah. people to pro developers. Run spreadsheets or launch the next spacecraft. Your limit is the sky. Oh, for oh, God's so sake. They Boy, they're selling it, said, aren't they? <laughs> now, wait, 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 wait. They're telling me that I'm limited. I can't go beyond the sky. How am I going to get a spacecraft out there? Come on, Aurora, guys. Well, they should have written is the sky is the limit. Yeah, Why exactly. You... If it's a limit, then I can't go beyond the clouds. Yeah. Come on, spacecrafts. Can I get Gnome with that? If you, you can, it's called... like Gnome, then KDE, it... then install Bluefin. Ah, there you go. I thought you were asking me a question. You were just reading the thing. Got it. I was about to be like, no, there's Bluefin, man. <laughs> So whichever one you decide on, if you decide on one, get the developer experience. I like it, choose your hardware. You got the choice between desktop slash laptop, and then you've got Asus framework and Surface as yep. separate things. And it turns out that uh, the framework is no longer. You don't have to actually choose the framework one. It's just baked into everything because the the kernel that they're using now, uh, um, that Fedora is using now, has all the the goodies baked in. So you don't actually need to get the framework one, though you can. Uh, the Asus and Surface, the Surface requires a specific kernel that's baked with the Microsoft stuff built in. The Surface has things that don't work in the base kernel, so you do need that. Um, I don't know why you would need the Asus ones, probably because of NVIDIA and stuff. But uh, so, 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 so it, will it only work on Asus framework and Surfaces? No, it'll work on everything. It's just that there are specific versions for those platforms if you're on those platforms. It, it works you, in everywhere Fedora works, which is everywhere. So how, what about things like um, Vert Manager and stuff like that? Built that, in. Built in. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, just whatever question you're going to ask, it's already done for you because 
Why not? This is the antithesis, though. Like, if you're coming in, you know, well, I just brung up my arch by hand, making sure that I didn't have absolutely any bloat that I didn't want. No, this is not for you. Get away. This is... You just go ahead and skip the next five minutes or so. This is not the operating system for you. <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure out what the difference between the developer and the normal version is. Uh, it comes with, um, it, I think the difference Probably was riding homebrew. the lightning with the developer edition. Well, it was no, 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 no. It's all it's all the same kernel and it's all the same stuff. The developer oh. edition has additional developer tooling like oh. Brew, but I think they all have that now. Uh, but this is why I'm saying go with the developer one because it gives you everything. And then if you decide one day that you can that that you want to not be on the developer edition uh, anymore, the beautiful part about this is that you don't have to go and say, you know what, rip out of the entire operating system and reinstall it. No, you just run a single command to rebase on the not developer edition, and the end, and you just keep rolling with it forever, and it's fantastic, mm. man. That's that's the idea, right? With this is you you if you've rooted and rommed a Android device, I haven't done that in years, but the idea sticks. You just get on one, and then it just takes you forever. And uh, there are ways to do, like, in-place upgrades to get onto, like, a different branch, like the developer branch or something like that. You don't mm -hmm. always have to just nuke it. This is a way to just, oh, well, I'm on a different path now. Just, that's fine. Mark that as your path, and it'll just take you from there. And there's really not a lot to break because the operating system is just one blob flapped onto your, oper uh, onto your laptop or desktop, and that's it. It won't break because it's been tested every way to Sunday and then given to you. If it's, I mean, if it's broken, you might be, <laughs> you might be up a creek. Wait for the next one. Okay, but, then, uh, well, then this is clearly then what's going to be my next experiment. So hopefully by the time I'm on the next Mint cast next week, all right, I'll be on uh, Aurora. Choose, because choose GNOME again. or KDE or Plasma and then just roll with it, man. It's really good. Yeah, because I mean, what, again, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the the thing that you've got to be aware of, though, is that uh, yes, it's a Fedora, but you're not going to be using DNF for anything. Don't DNF mm -hmm. update. Don't DNF install. Don't none of that. None of that. It's all uh, flat packs, isn't it? Well, sort of. I mean, yes, but there are so many other ways to get your software right. Be one of the big complaints about flat pack is that well, it doesn't do command line apps. That's why Homebrew is built in. That's why that's available to you. So you can install all your GUI apps with Flatpak just like you normally would. Bill can get di uh, Discord and whatever he wants. But if you want to add in um, additional command line apps, that's where Homebrew is going to come in. So I, I run uh, Ping Crush all the time, which is a little command line utility that will take your pings, uh, strip out extra stuff, uh, and then give you just a compressed version of that ping. So it's easier for the web. Um, and that's just a command line utility I grabbed from Homebrew. I wouldn't be able to do that um, in an Aurora without, you know, doing taking extra steps. Like, okay, well, I'll set up my Arch distro box, and then in there I'll get Pink Crush. But you can do that too. That's that's the beautiful thing, right? Even though you're on a Fedora, you can still get access to the Ubuntu repositories, the Arch repositories, the AUR even, if that's what you want. Um, and it's it's all integrated into your desktop. So, I mean, every route, every path, every piece of software that you're like, well, this is why I can't leave Ubuntu. That's fine. Yeah, you can, because DistroBox, you can get access to whatever it is, whatever feature it is. And the best part about all of this is, you, you can tell I like it. The best part yeah. about all of this is all of your codecs, all of the stuff, the reason that I got on Linux Mint in the first place was that I didn't have to think about adding in all oh, FFmpeg or any of these things to be able to just double click on a video and play it. All that stuff is already built in. So all you gotta do is just use your computer. I'm telling you guys, it is a different way to so think does about this, this. Does Aurora have GUI package manager tools like Software Center or an you app can. center? Yeah, you can. But okay. but again, like when you're when you're using this, um, you have you have so many tools that are at your disposal that are not GUI based. So it well, I know. A... I was just wondering if you're if you want to try something like this, but you're yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, You don't know that, and I don't know all these different ways of installing software. You know, is there like a one-stop shop where I can just get this going and get the things I, I need? I think so. Actually, I think so. Um, I, I, I never. I seriously, you just type in just update, 
right? And it and it just handles everything for you. So I've I've never actually tried the GUI stuff. Um, like Discover so will just work with the flat packs. It I've does. It actually, bugs me about yeah. It it bugs me about updating my software. So I suppose it does. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, just going back to the NAS thing then. Since I'm uh, since I'm just going to buy a bespoke buy from. Oh yeah. What are you thing. looking at? Yeah. So I was. That's. I don't want for the man that doesn't have enough money but still spends like he's a millionaire. I do have to make some attempt at being not too expensive. So I saw, so I, I saw, what was it? Okay, now I need to remember which one it was. It was a Synology disk station. Yep, just buy uh, it. Don't even ask. That's okay. the right one. Okay. It's it's good for if, if you don't have a huge uh, networking prowess, that's a good one to start with because it's, it, just handles a lot of those things for you. Yeah. What's um? What's that other one? It's not Untangle, but it's um, it's a NAS Linux-based NAS type solution. It does virtualization and stuff too. So does Synology. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a subscription. Like you buy it yearly. You you pay them yearly, like fifty bucks, and uh, the software just keeps keeps rolling. Um, I think they have a free tier where you can only do so many disks or something like that. But once you go beyond that, you got to pay. I can't remember the name of that software or that operating system, but it's, it's it seemed really good. It was a competitor to the Synologies, but if you don't want to think about it, um, you know, you buy a Synology, the operating system is part of it, so you don't have to worry about upgrading. And when you get a new Synology, I mean, the upgrade cost or the uh, the operating system cost is baked into the hardware when you buy mm-hmm. it, so you don't really have to think about it. That's why I think Synology is the better choice for someone that doesn't want to think about it too much. Mm-hmm. It is oh, it yeah. is just really good. And the software is really good and it runs Docker. So you can run anything you want once you get sufficiently curious without having to worry about if your operating system is gonna explode underneath you or not. Yeah, that's what it was. Disk station D S two two three J. That one's the one that can do two disks then. Yeah, uh, two bay. Yeah, two yeah. bay. So I mean you can get like eight terabyte disks and it'll do mirroring or uh whatever you want. Um you get into uh, really interesting situations when you go to the 400 series. So you can have four disks, and it does. Um, uh, it'll do like weird. Just just add the storage to the thing, and it'll kind of handle it for you. You can have like a backup disk or whatever to to back up important junk, or you can kind of decide. Um, and it's got like it's basically got like a full desktop to play with. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you hook up a, a monitor to it, I think you can get it in the browser too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's. It's good stuff, man. It's good software. You pay for it um, in the cost of the hardware and everything, but I think it's worth it if you... Is, if it, is it better to have one big drive or two small drives in it? It depends on what you want to do. Like, um, if, if all you're looking for is just raw storage, um, then just, yeah, man, slap the biggest drive you can afford into it. Get a good quality one. I have a... Uh, personally, I have a uh, an aversion to any size disk that's not a power of two so like miss me with that 12 and 14 terabyte drive absolutely not i'll take the 16 please thank you very much mm-hmm. um so it's like you know two four eight sixteen thirty two so i have to wait for a long time before i can upgrade 16s to 32s because it's going to take a technological leap ahead to be able to do that so i'll be stuck on 16s for a while but um that, that's just a that's a superstition thing i'm gonna get somebody from seagate on here to uh Oh, Try to the talk um, you out of that. No, no, no. I, I like the numbers go against me, man. Um, <laughs> who is it? The um, the NAS guys that do the the uh, commodity hardware. What is their name? Backblaze. They put out a um, a chart or a a report every year, and these guys buy desktop level hard drives, right? But they stick like a hundred of them in a in a bay, and they actually then report on failing. And, but these guys have, you know, millions of disks. So these guys are the best people to tell you which disk to buy for your desktop that will fail the least. They've got the numbers to back it up. And you know who wins? Seagate. They have, they have some of the worst rep because of the past 10 years. They have some of the worst rep, but they have some of the best drives, the longest living drives uh, out there. And then HGST, before they were bought up by Western Digital, was the pinnacle. But, um, yeah, I mean, the numbers bared out. Three terabyte drives were pretty good. Um and uh, I think what they they tested a lot of six and eights and I think tens maybe or twelves I can't remember but 
Um, they, yeah, the numbers are against me, but I, it's a superstition, man. It doesn't have to make sense. Oh, uh, yeah, you got me there. <laughs> yeah, because I've got threes in the one server and twelves in the other, and yeah. they're they're Iron Wolf. They're gonna last. They're gonna last longer than I am. Maybe. So, yeah. <laughs> I should probably shut my mouth, but yeah. Um, I'll knock on wood for you. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Now, Majid, you got to build your own NAS. You got to build it from scratch. Listen, I'm still in that camp, Bill. I'm with you, but yeah. I okay, also Okay, so if I do want to, to so if I do want to build it from scratch, what what do I the I figured out you can get any kind of old home server Absolutely. type machine. I'm uh, using that $100 uh Lenovo that Moss found for me on on uh, eBay, took the took the motherboard out of that, slapped it into this enclosure. And the only thing it's, I mean, I put um, it's too old for NVMe. It won't boot the NVMe, but it will. I mean, it's server. It runs just that. Fine. W- that was a lifesaver for me. Uh, I upgraded from a SATA disk to an NVMe, and it freed up a SATA port so that I could add more storage. Yeah. So you know, it it is a bit of a jump up. I would pay the extra eighty dollars on eBay to get something that supported NVMe, just and for that. You know, but you what, have other options. What about for the power? So- but what about power source? Because isn't one of the things about these that you, <clears throat> at least the Synologies anyway, they sip power comparatively speaking. Compared well, if to, it's about power, you can you can use a Pi or Rock Pro sixty four. No, nope, I've got the answer for you. I've got the answer for you, Majid. So the the difference is that a lot of these analogies and things are running on uh, very low power chips. Mm-hmm. That does not mean that you can't go and get an Intel N one hundred right now in a mini PC or something like that, uh, or or even in in a in a more full size PC, uh, and still sip that same amount of power. The the reason that the Synologies use so little power is because they don't have an audio card, right? Because it's not yeah. a desktop. They don't have, you know, an expensive video card or, you know, even in um even anything particularly special because all their stuff is accessed over a web page. So, you know, there is no display in there. Uh well there might be, I don't even know. But the the idea is that they strip away everything that you don't need. So in a case like that, um, there's really no beating it other than with a pie or something like orange pie or maybe even raspberry pie. Um, but honestly, will you notice the difference between six watts at idle and 10 watts at idle? Does I, that amount of wattage really make a difference to you? And if it does, Synology wins every time, hands down. But yeah, I it think. Doesn't, so if, basically, I'd have to get. All I so all I need is a motherboard, really, As and a, a, and a case it, with yeah, with yeah. mounting for yeah. for extra hard drives. Yeah, yeah. And then you want to make sure that that power supply can. Of course, if you're not using the video card and all that, you know that frees up some wattage. Um, you buy you buy some old Think Center or something like that on mm. Amazon or eBay. It'll be plenty. To do the job because you could actually even uh you could actually even get for like 10 15 dollars you can a pcie card for to add more SATA ports to the whole thing if you needed to and then you got to learn all about uuids and mounting things properly oh yeah oh yeah but so the the real question that you kind of have to ask yourself is yeah you're saving money when you're buying um, commodity hardware like that, extra hardware, this Think Center or whatever, and adding a card into it, and you come out, you know, four hundred dollars cheaper than going the Synology. But is your time worth yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. That's right? exactly what I was thinking. The the, is the this difference worth for my me, time? right? The difference for me is that I like tinkering with hardware. I yeah, like buying new hardware, sniffing it, and then stuffing it into a drive uh, a drive bay, never to see it again for the next eight years until it dies. You know, I I enjoy getting into the muck and uh, updating my my software um updating ubuntu getting it to the next version doing that process oh god it broke let's roll it back let's figure out what went wrong tinker with that a little bit more get it updated i like that kind of thing though so when i'm doing that i'm having fun so i don't see it as any kind of time sink or my money well worth spent or anything like that you know so i enjoy it if mm-hmm. you don't enjoy it don't make that mistake 
of going down that path. Oh, I'll save a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, you will, but you're going to hate yourself for it. So, you know, go down the easier path, the self, the, the non-self-managed path. You still have the ability to install weird software and, and do all that kind of stuff. But Synology is going to be there holding your hand to making sure that you don't make terrible, terrible, terrible mistakes all the way mm-hmm. through. So you've got to decide. That's that's the real question that you have yeah. to ask yourself is, is it worth my time or not? And then if you fall down the trap like I did where, yeah, that's I saved the money on here. the, on the uh, motherboard, but the hard drives were... Oh, God. No, you're still screwed with that, Majid. You still have to buy the hard drive, so you are still 100% on the hook for that cost. Yeah, because the the good ones, the Iron Wolf, it is really, honestly, the only one that I will recommend. Bit of a premium. And they they are a bit... The pros or the non-pros? Iron Wolf pros or no? Um, I've got pros in my Jellyfin server and then non-pros in the uh, next cloud. I be the other way around. If but. you care about your data, and, and this, this advice is for you too, Majid. If you mm-hmm. care about your data, do not buy a hard drive with less than a five-year warranty. And that tends to be the, the uh, Western Digital Red Pros, the Iron Wolf Pros, the yeah. HGSTs, the Western Digital Golds. Those are the ones that are meant for this long run time, all day, 24-hour spin up, you know, they don't spin down so that whenever you're going to – the thing has been idle all day. You double-click on the Plex app or you tap on the Plex app and it opens up and you click your movie. The the disk doesn't have to spin up to then start seeking. Uh, it's already spun up. You're wasting watts that way. But if you're trying to get this data to be instantly available all the time, then, uh, then that's what's going to have to happen. And that means slightly more heat, but – with a warranty like that, you're the way that I look at these warranties is that's how long the company that made it expects it to work. Because they do not with warranties, they don't want to pay me. They don't mm-hmm. want to give me a new drive. That mm-hmm. is their thing. So the warranty mm-hmm. is just long enough that they don't have to. And I'll and, say that that we were talking about Amazon having being excellent with uh, returns. Seagate is exactly the same way if you get on their website because I was Yeah. I was having a weird problem a couple of years ago with my Rock Pro 64 trying to trying to do a uh, – first I did it with ButterFS did a butter because ButterFS and ZFS have a similar way of making a RAID structure, and it – You're living on the edge, got, my man. I, I think even, oh, isn't ButterFS still kind of dangerous to do that with? I mean – Certain I don't know types if it of is. raid that I think uh they said at one time raid five and ten don't do it, but I don't know why you would yeah. do that with ButterFS anyway. I just don't raid anymore. I well, just have a disc with data on it and another disc that I R sync to. Like I don't even bother with raid one. Like why? ZFS um, has been flawless, except yeah. on the Rock Pro sixty four. But then I don't think those devices are are meant to write to more than one disc at the same time, which yeah. is what you're basically doing. Um, and so I, I ruined, I ended up ruining the discs somehow. I could not recover them no matter what I did. These things weren't even five months old. So I get on Seagate's website and they sent me a new one before I even sent the old one back to them. So yeah, they're oh, uh, Majid, where is this box going to be? Is it going to so, be like in he, in there or? tucked away somewhere tucked away somewhere oh fantastic then you don't even have to go iron wolf pro you can go the exos they're loud drives like the drives are louder you can hear them seeking and stuff and okay. like you can even hear the little grindy of it like the the little arm moving around and stuff but if you're not going to hear it you can save a lot of money by Hasn't going there those. been some some uh, uh firmware problems with those exos drives have there I, I, I anecdotally, I just heard something about that on uh, two and a half admins. Ah, maybe. Uh, I, I, I go with Iron Wolf Pros because they're quieter, yeah. and I and and it goes right behind me where I'm watching TV. So if it's too loud, it's kind of annoying. So I don't want. They were they to were do recommending that. the Iron Wolves above even the Exos oh, yeah. because you think that you're getting something with an Exos because it's this enterprise. Well, it, they 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 bill yeah. it as an enterprise drive. Uh, which, you know, what the hell does that mean? You know, it's either going to be a NAS or it's going to be... No, well, the, those drives are meant to go into uh, environments that you're not going to find an Iron Wolf, Iron, Wolf, Iron Wolf Pro in. Like, they're going to go into, like, those 24-bay uh, 
disk things that you yeah, then hook yeah. up to a RAID controller, and then you know, then you hook it up to a server or something like that, or into a entire rack full of those things, and they're all spinning up and and uh, going at you know seeking and things like that, and you're you're introducing a lot of vibration. So, I think that's what the what that entire line is meant for is for you know slightly more rugged environments than oh. uh, you know a two bay disk station or a four bay disk station, you know. So cooling then, yeah, is a consideration, um, depending on what you're asking this thing to do. Are you yeah. gonna? Do you want it to be internet facing, or because <laughs> there's some? But now we're getting into a different discipline. Now we're getting into the yeah. networking of it all. Yeah. Um. I the short answer is I don't know. Yeah. I would. It, it would be good to be able to access stuff of it. From outside, I would assume I could tail scale that. Correct. You can. Just do that. Don't expose anything to the internet, especially if you're not exactly sure what you're doing when you're port forwarding. Like, mm-hmm. don't do that. Just use tail scale and then slowly learn this networking stuff, if you care to, with tail scale. Because they've got, they've got stuff to expose things out to the internet. Um, but, again, you know, don't, yeah, don't just poke just holes into be... your own home network. Yet. <laughs> you and maybe some family members or something like that. That's yeah. perfectly fine. It mm-hmm. wasn't an option, or at least I didn't think it was an option for like our next cloud because that's got to have multiple people being able to access it. And... Right. But you can do that through Tailscale, though. Like you can actually expose it that way. Or you can put Cloudflare in front of it to make sure that, uh... but again, we're we're in that discipline of you have to know what a proxy is. You have to know how to actually do the the traversal and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but um, which which does make it more difficult than just saying you know what ah four four three poke it a hole and then we'll just that's fine. But see, I've got the reverse proxy set up, and which is the only thing technically, the reverse proxy is the only thing that's facing the internet, and then that's yeah. another layer of abstraction you got to get past in order to get to everything else. And then yeah. on the other side of that is Cloudflare. I just don't have Cloudflare in front of the next cloud because Calabra yeah. has problems with oh, okay yeah yeah, cloud, yeah. Cloudflare so. I mean, <laughs> networking is, you're going to feel like you're learning computers all over again when it comes to networking because... But it's a, but it's a wonderful, like, thousand-foot view yeah. of, like, what's actually going on. You know, whenever in The Matrix, like, he goes in there and he starts seeing everything in code? Right. You know, like, like you, you open up your phone and you open up an app and it, like, grabs stuff from the internet. Like, you're things, seeing it in code, you know? Like, things <laughs> are starting to make sense that didn't, that really, you really didn't understand how this thing was working before. Yeah. And it turns out a lot of the interfacing between applications and uh clients and servers all of that is all you know to understand that is to understand networking on some yeah. level you know yeah because it's all it's all kind of the same thing yeah so, it's really cool man it's a really cool way to look it at is. stuff it's worth getting into wow Ooh. well this one got away from us real quick a little bit yeah there's this as usual thinking what are we going to talk about and we always find good stuff to talk about. I don't worry about, about it. <laughs> Enterprise networking and yeah. uh, storage. So that was the answer to that question. <laughs> yes. Uh, and right yes, on. and it's very true. Linux does bend you to its will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. But luckily, I think Synology is still based on Linux. So you're you're not too far away, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure. It, uh, apparently everything is, isn't it? Oh, okay. Of, of one la- One last question. One last question. Go for it. NAS versus home server. So I just go whole hog and just get a home server. I haven't got a home server. I like having my NAS separate. Um, I, okay. I do run a couple of home servery things on my NAS, but the rest of the stuff runs on a Proxmox hypervisor. I, I spin up a VM, and then within that, I'll tend to run containers or do weird stuff. But um, but I like having a separate server so that I can tinker with it, and if I have ever ever have to take it down or reboot it or do maintenance on it or anything like that, my NAS stays up. I can still access Plex, watch a movie while I'm doing all of that stuff. Um, it's nice to have them separate, though you don't have to do that. Okay. And you don't, because like each of these machines is running all these Docker containers, and there's like nine websites, a 
Jellyfin, and I actually I could run all of this on one machine, but I split it up for basically the same reason Leo was describing, yeah. um, where you can have all these things, especially with something like Docker or even Snaps to to a lesser degree. Um, so you can have all these things running on one machine because the machines nowadays are powerful enough. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you can get enough uh, RAM in these things to basically run all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's and what I'm saying kinda... about the, the N100s, man. They're little rinky-dink processors, but, you know, they're the Celerons of the current day. Yeah. But yet, mm-hmm. yet, they're they're as powerful as, uh, you know, like an i5 a few years ago. So It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe start with a Synology or something like that and then learn the networking. It, learning the networking, I think, is probably... I would almost recommend getting a firm... Well, at least to start to get a firm grasp of how all that works. So Gen 2, right? <laughs> yeah, Gen 2. <laughs> The whole time I was listening to you guys talking about Gen 2, I, I was screaming. I was driving through Tennessee when I was listening to that, and I was screaming in, like, you guys didn't compile your kernel, did you? Because you nope. didn't mention that once. Nope. And that is the only place that ever screwed me up with Gen 2, because I, I, who knows all that crap, honestly? What? Well, it, when, once you get your use flags figured out, then it, it's, it's usually pretty smooth sailing after that but yeah i mean make sure you have backups that's the that's the big thing when you blow it up you don't have to start over you just roll back to your previous backup that's why i like the atomic so much but you know once you got that in place then then you can really start to play i've got i've still got maintenance to do there's a couple of use flags i need to fix ruby's broken for some reason but it's not affecting the operating system it's not affecting boot or anything i just need to go in and poke it a little bit make it work it struck me as a kind of operating system that really only makes sense for people that leave their machine running. No, I've, I've got I've got GNOME on it. I close it all the time. It sleeps all the time. Yeah, but, you don't you don't no. Uh, once you get it set, you upgrade it maybe once every few weeks because this is this is a pretty weak weeks. processor. Right, but you know I'd sleep it, use it regularly. I, I'm on Discord on it. I type a lot on it. You know I t- I've taken uh, operating system history notes on it. You know it it's a it's a machine like any other. It's just that you have to get into the grit a little bit more sometimes. So you don't uh, get you don't get addicted to the upgrades the way Arch users do. You can if you've got a powerful processor. I mean, I I do. I've I've actually got this thing now where I'm going to fire up the live stream every time I do an emerge because it takes forever. And some people are like me and like watching scrolly text on the screen. And if I could do that, put put a little lo-fi music in the background. And then just let that run for 12 hours because sometimes that's how long it takes. Yeah, man, I'm going to do that so that whenever I go out and I'm, I'm working on something else, I can turn my stream on and then just watch from anywhere, you know, no matter where I'm at. It's going through Twitch that or YouTube cool. or whatever. Yeah. I think I would be, if I was to use it, I would probably, for big things like Chromium, if I needed Chromium or... Just get the binary, dude. Get don't the even binary. Bother. I mean, yeah. you're I, not going to... That, that's how I run Firefox. I don't compile yeah. Firefox. I go to firefox.com. I download their Linux tar bzip2. Yeah. And then I chuck it in bin, sbin, or wherever it wanted me to put it. That's it. I, I run the real live Firefox. I was running that that tarball on Ubuntu. Man, that was fast. It's so good, dude. It's yeah. the right way to run Firefox because it takes so. care of itself. And right. you, and you know they keep talking about oh well, this is why we do containerized packages, why we use Flatpak or Snap or whatever because you know whenever you update it, it doesn't crash in the middle of your. I know. So like, that's a, me too. The BZ two because every time I close it, it updates in the background or when I open it. When I open it, it updates. And then I just get on with my life, and it never crashes like that either. And this is straight from the Firefox tab. Of course. Of course I'm going to use that. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up then. Um, get a hold of us. Tell us what you think. Show at linuxotc.org. Or hit us up some other way. Uh, I think we're on. Yeah, we are on Mastodon. Yep. Um, yep. I'm using Mastodon a lot more Linux, now these days. Oh, yeah, boy. LinuxOTC at Fostadon.org, I believe. That's it. We'll be back mm-hmm. in two weeks. Until then, I've been Bill. I've been Majid. And I'm still Leo. Have a good one, folks. <laughs> <laughs>